It's really, really good to be here today and to see so many gathered here today. It is evidence that we are getting better, that people who are sick are healing up and we're able to be here together. We had a great crowd for our 9 a.m., the largest we've had in, in a month. And then here now as well, if you're visiting, just thank you for coming to be a part of this. Uh, as most know, and a lot who watch online, there were quite a few COVID cases experienced by members of the church here, and I'm happy to report that everyone is better, that no one had to be hospitalized for any amount of time, and everyone, I think maybe one person is still at home, maybe two, feeling okay, and we're just really thankful for that. There are certain things in life that you just have to deal with. You do it together, you encourage each other through, and if the Lord is with us, here we are, gathered together again for worship. For those who are still at home, who are unable via quarantine or other reasons to be here. We welcome them back soon and we pray for that to, to, to remedy itself easily and shortly for them as well. If you would open your Bibles to Ephesians, you'd be in a great place for some study we need to do today. We will be walking through several New Testament passages. While you're getting there, let me tell you about an experience that I had here in this building five weeks ago. I think it was five Sundays ago on a Sunday night, I had the chance to gather next door in one of our classrooms with 20 of our young people. There were high school students, college students, young people in their 20s, and we were studying what it means to be a member, an active, useful, service-filled member of a local church. And I began by asking them a question. In fact, when they walked into the classroom, it was already written on the board, and I wanted them to begin immediately before we read our first passage, I wanted them thinking about the answer to something very specific. And so in the same way today, I'm sharing this with you. They're here today as well, but I'm sharing it with you. So as we begin, would you please just take a moment and put some attention on how you, individually you, would answer this question. What is your work? What is your work in Christ church? What, what do you do? What is your part of the body? What is the fruit that comes forth because you are a part of his church? Let me ask it in a couple of other ways. Maybe someone comes up to you and says, are you a member of the church? And you say, absolutely, I'm a member of the church. Greatest thing in my life. What if they came back and said, okay, so what part do you play in that? If you're a part of the church, like what do you do in the church? How would you begin to answer that question? Maybe we can be even a bit more specific. Someone says, are you a member of the Lindale local church? And you say, yes, been a member of the Lindale church for five years. Great. So what do you do there? What is your part in it? What are you producing? You know, it's really easy to say we have a preacher who preachers and we have shepherds who shepherd and we have song leaders who song lead and we have Bible class teachers who teach Bible classes. But that's just the beginning of the story. And that's not even my question today. The question is, how would you begin to answer that? There are a lot of members of this church who would have great answers for that. We're so richly blessed. A lot of it would have to do with what you produce on a Sunday while you're here. And a lot of it would have to do with the other six days of the week. But the question isn't about us today. The question is just for you and just for me. How would you answer that? Let me tell you a little bit about how we usually approach this subject. Has anyone here ever heard a sermon titled The Work of the Church? Like we've all heard that. I use the most boring font possible to represent how oft we hear this sermon. I've preached it a handful of times, the work of the church. But let me ask you, if you were going to listen to a sermon today on the work of the church, how would that usually go? For the most part, we believe that the work of the church is about the money that is contributed on a Sunday. You put the money in the back, it gets collected. This is for the work of the church. There are only a certain number of authorized ways that we use that money. And so for a lot of people, I hope not you, but for a lot of people, their work in the local church is hiring the church to do their work. That's called institutionalization, where we make the church into a business. We say, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to be working so on Sunday, I'll put some money in and therefore the elders will do that work for us. I think you already know what I'm about to say. The work of the church that is accomplished through the contribution is beautiful and important and specific and barely even a percent of the work of Christ church. The work of Christ church involves the activity of each person every day. 
and what you and I individually contribute. So begin thinking through this. And as I did with the young people a few weeks ago, I'm going to walk you through a few Bible verses. The first one is Ephesians. That's why I've asked you to open your scripture there to Ephesians 2. As we're walking through this, all that this list is going to do, it's not necessarily going to tell you what your answer is supposed to be. Each person will have their own answers. We've each been given different gifts, different maturity and abilities. What I think it will prove is that no matter who you are, you got to have one or more than one. Every single member should leave here today going, what is my work? Because I must produce to be a part of the body of Jesus. That's the idea. And I hope that these passages will help. So let's take a look at them and go through them in succession. Ephesians 2. Begin with me in Ephesians 2 verse 8, please. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. What a great passage. We all love this passage. All of our religious friends love this passage. This passage says, your works are not what saved you. And that is absolutely true. Jordan Schaus did an amazing job last week talking about grace. No amount of works we do warrants the grace of God. The grace of God is given when we turn our attention and invest ourselves in faith in him. But listen to the next verse, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Hear me clearly. It is not because of your good works that you were saved, but you have been saved so that you can produce good works. You say, why me? Why would God save me? Why would Christ's blood cover me? I've never done enough. It's because at some point along the way, God looked at you, specifically you, and said, that's a worker I can use. If I'll save Rob, if I'll save Josh, if I'll save Sam, and I'll put my grace on them, they will get to work. They will start doing things as hands for me. And so the question is, have you been saved by the grace of God? Everybody in the room says, amen, I have. Okay, but why? To what end? To what work? That's where we need to begin turning our attention today. I mean, move forward just a couple of chapters. In Ephesians chapter 4, he delves into this more deeply, into roles and activities. So look with me in verse 11. Ephesians 4, let's read maybe 11, 12, and 13 here. He said, he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now, we all pretty much know this passage, but here's the mistake. You ready for the mistake? Every local church member reads this passage and says, you know, God did need workers. So he set aside special people to do the work. He set aside apostles and prophets in the first century. They, those don't exist today, but he set them aside. Now we have evangelists like Chris. We have pastors like the nine shepherds at the Lindell Church. And we have teachers who are equipped to teach the kids. That's our workers now. And we, we fall into this sad reality and we got to break it. Mission statement, Lindell Church 2021. We got to break this idea that 90% of the people just consume. They get taught, they get led, they get fed, and this small group of labeled workers do the work. I'll show you why that's wrong. Look at verse 12. What are those people supposed to be doing? They are actually equipping the saints. What does it say? Why am I preaching today? What's the point? To feed everyone? Not necessarily. In part but only so that you might be fed, so that you might do what? Engage in the work of service. And so even in 2 Timothy 2, where Paul told Timothy, he said, I want you to teach faithful men so that they would teach others as well. It's okay to be a consumer sometimes. I mean, that's kind of what you're doing right now. Everybody's just staring at me, consuming whatever we're studying. It's okay to be a consumer sometimes. If you're at home at worship and you can't be at worship, all you get to do right now is consume. You're not able to produce or change or affect. But remember, all of that consumption is to equip you to do your work. I'm going to go back to the question again. What is that? 
As you move forward, you see in verse 14, he says, we don't want to be tossed around by every false teaching and false doctrine. Look in verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, we, all of us, are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Now notice this carefully, it's really important. From whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by the quality of the preacher's sermons and its length. No. We are fitted and held together by what every joint. I'm tempted to do it. There are 125 people in the room. I'm tempted to just start going around the room saying this person and this person and Gary and Lisa and everybody here. You could write your name there by every joint. You could say the strength of our church is by what what I supply according to the proper working of each individual part. That's me. I'm an individual part causing the growth of the body. You say, what's my work? Causing the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now, not everybody's a preacher or an elder or a teacher, but everyone is a contributor to the two things you read in verse 16. Make the body grow and infuse it with greater amounts of love. What is your work in carrying out that outcome? There's some imagery used in 1 Corinthians. It's so beautiful. It's it's really unmistakable. It's the idea of the body. In 1 Corinthians 12, the church is pictured as like a human body. And certainly the universal church, whether you're a member at Lindale or not, if you're part of the body of Christ, you're part of that body. Some say that local churches are also like local bodies. But either way, I want you to notice something. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12, begin with me here in verse 12. He says, even as the body, the body of Christ, even as the body is one and yet has many members, all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, just as also is Christ. For by one spirit, watch this, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spiritual drink. Now let me stop there a moment. If I ask you, have you been baptized into the body? You might say, yes, I am now a part of the body. So God has a right to look at you and say, you're a part of the body now, so start doing something. The body functions when all parts of the body are doing their proper thing, no matter what you might be. And he goes on to explain that. He says the body is not one member, but many, verse 14. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for any reason any less a part of the body. If the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, Where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? I got to pause a minute. I went three days without the sense of smell. I value this. If you're a sense of smell part of this church, we need you because smelling is amazing. But now God has placed the members. Watch this. Not just the the, the preacher and the elders and the people who, who do so many things. God has now placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one member... Where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. One more verse. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, to the head or the feet, I have no need of you. Now, let me say something about verse 21. I've not seen that. I've been in the church my whole life, 40 plus years. I've been preaching 20 years. I've never seen one person look at another person in the church and say, I'm important, you're unimportant. My work matters, your work doesn't matter. I've never seen that, but I'll tell you what I do see. I see members who look at themselves and say, my work doesn't matter. That guy's work matters. That family's work matters. What they're, so my work doesn't matter, so I'm not going to do any. I'm just going to kind of be there. I'll go to church. I'll sit in my spot. I'll do the things I'm supposed to do. You guys, I don't want to talk about something negative like cancer today, but it's something we understand. Do you know what cancer is? Cancer is when some cells in the body created to do good work stop doing their good work. When cells mutate away from the work, and and it's just a few at first, it doesn't seem like much, it's in some spot in the body, the body's still functioning fine. There's just some sections that aren't doing their work. But that begins to do what? Grow and take over. And the smallest part of the body's uh, organs I've never really even heard of, can take someone's entire life. And so you're a cell in the body. What's your function? And do you understand how important it is to our future? Open your Bible with me to Titus chapter 2. 
As you go to Titus 2, we get to zero in a little bit on grace, which I'm glad we get to zero in on grace. Once again, Jordan Schaus's four lessons on grace last week, so great, very important for us. And he pointed out that it's not because of how great a worker I am that I was saved. We covered that already. But one of the things I'm afraid of is that this lesson will end here in a little while and people will leave going, ooh, I need to do more work. I need to make more phone calls. I need to be a worship more faithfully. I need to be more of an integral part. I don't really want to. It's not really something that, that I care about, but I guess I need to do it. Folks, it's just not going to work like that. I mean, what, I just come in every month and preach some rah, 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 sermon and people do better. But, you know, Mr. Eugene was here for both sermons today and he came up to me afterwards and he said, Chris, here's your battle. I said, what's my battle, Mr. Eugene? He said, people do what they want to do and they don't do what, that guy's 90 years old. Do you think he knows what he's talking about? They don't do what they don't want to do. So how's it going to help me going, all right, guys, we're not just consumers here. We don't just come in and get the sermon we want and the, and the scriptures that we want and then just leave if it's something you don't want to do. But that's what grace is all about. Let me show you what I'm talking about. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says the grace of God has appeared. The great grace of God bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope of the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. If you leave here today thinking, mm, I think I'm a consumer. I, I don't think I've been producing very much and I can do better. And you're looking for motivation. Look no further than the grace of God. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, when you understand who you now are and what you are a part of and what it means to be covered with the love of God and assured a place in heaven, he says, verse 14, he gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works, zealous. Show me. What do we need around here? Who needs to be encouraged? Who has a story to tell? Where can I work? I'm zealous. I can't wait to get to work. And I would say if you leave here thinking, you know, I just don't really care and I don't know how to make myself care. You're probably not going to believe me on this. But it is a lack of acceptance of the grace of God that has got you stuck in that place. It is a lack of acceptance of what you are a part of. If we really understood what it meant to be a part of the body where the head is Jesus, all we would want to do is carry out his work. We'd want to do nothing else. All day, that's all I'd want to do. And to the extent that we begin to learn that grace, that is the outcome for you and for me. Go to Colossians. I want to make a, a slight change in imagery here. Go to the book of Colossians with me. I want you to start to see that when we're talking about good works, we're also talking about bearing fruit. You're probably familiar with the terminology of bearing fruit, and we'll look at some other passages in a moment. But the connection is made very easily for us here in Colossians 1, talking to Christians like you and like me. And when he says good works, he means producing things that people around you can draw from. So let me show you what I'm talking about. We begin here maybe in verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be, Colossians 1, 9, filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Stick with me on this. To please him in all respects. How? Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, I want you to understand the way plants work. You consume the fertilizer and nutrients that you need and it produces something. He says, I want you to consume the knowledge of God. I want you to read the word and go to church and listen to the sermons and read the scripture and know. But the purpose is so that you will bear fruit that the people around you can draw from. I'm afraid that in the church today, there is a disconnect between consuming and producing. There's a large percentage of the church that just consumes but they don't understand that the whole reason for consuming is to produce fruit. And I wonder if this goes back to our kids a little bit. I love Psalm 128. Let me talk about kids for a moment. Psalm 128, it talks about at home, how children, I love this verse. My kids don't love this verse, but I kind of love it. Your children should be olive plants around your table. So, you know, kids are kind of consumers. Is that a fair thing to say? They, 
I mean, they just like take it. You give it, they take it, they take it, they take it. And that's the way God built it. God built it that way. But before they even leave home, they should be growing into something that actually begins to contribute to the well-being of the family. I like olives, by the way. Some people either like olives or they're wrong. I like green olives, purple olives. You can paint one pink and I'd eat it. I love olives. We're getting to Thanksgiving. It's olive country. But look, the idea is if I want an olive... I should be able to reach over to a plant that I planted and fertilized, and I should be able to get an olive off of it, if it's an olive. But you know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid that we've raised our kids to purely be consumers. It's like in Proverbs, was it Proverbs 30 or 31, where Lemuel's two kids were named Gimme and Gimme? His kids were named Gimme, Gimme. And we raise the kids to just take, just take, 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 take. You don't want more, don't take more. Just take what you want and not produce anything. And then they leave and you're like, okay, go out and build a productive life and go be a productive member of a church. They can't make that jump. That's a Grand Canyon jump between pure consumer and actual helper. And maybe that's what's happened in the church today. Those kids grew up. They go to the church on Sunday. If they want a sermon, they go. If Sunday night comes, you don't want a sermon. Don't go because it's all about you getting what you want. If you you want to be a part of it, do it and get it. But when you say, look, you got to be here because we're producing. We're talking to each other. We're encouraging each other. We're getting not well. That doesn't even compute with a whole generation of people. We need to learn that the whole reason for consuming is to produce. And you know, the Bible talks a lot about that. I want you to go to John 15 with me. We'll just reference the Matthew passage for a moment. John 15 is about to take the point that I just made, and Jesus is about to ratchet it up about as high as it can possibly go. So get ready for that. John 15. You know, in Matthew 13, we know about this. We know about the parable of the sower and the seed. And the beauty is that how you know that you have received the word. Colossians 1, you've received the knowledge. How do I know if I've received the knowledge? Uh, Jordan preached on this last week. How do I know if I'm saved? How do I know if I'm part of the body of Christ? Well, most people, we just ask them and they answer yes. And that's the end of it. But that's not what Matthew says. Matthew says, you know, you have received the word when you begin to produce fruit 30 fold, 60 fold and 100 fold. Remember the question? What is your work in Christ church? Tell me about the 30 fold you're producing. Tell me about the people you're getting to know. Tell me about the sick people that you're visiting. Tell me about the And we have people here who are doing that work. But everybody should be doing that work. Because in John 15, here's the way Jesus said it. In John 15, Jesus said this in verse one, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Okay, can you see that imagery? There's this vine, it's thick, it's Jesus. And there are these branches that come off of it. Look at this. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. I didn't say that. That, To me, that's a little intense. That's Jesus' message. His message is, if you've connected to me, you're drawing nutrients from me. You're consuming what I'm giving you. You will become my produce for the world. They will be able to draw from you. And he said, if it's not happening, then you will be cut off. He said, and every branch that bears fruit, we're going to talk more about what that is in a minute. Our young people gave a tremendous list of what that was. And I'm going to give you their list in a minute. Beautifully done. If we're bearing fruit, God prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. The objective is to bear more. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Tell me about a scenario. I feel like I'm about to push this too far. Tell me about a scenario where someone is connected to Christ and not working. Tell me about a scenario where someone is grafted to the grace of Jesus and they are not a contributor in the church. That scenario exists in our world. It does not exist in Christ. It does not exist in Christ. In Christ, all who are his are being pruned and shaped to produce. One more passage, Luke chapter 13. It may be, and I'm right there with you actually. If you feel this way, I'm here with you. It may be that you're studying this going, "Uh uh-oh, that's not really me. I mean, I try to be nice to people. 
and I go to church most of the time. But, you know, I, I got to tell you if, you, if you gave me a white card right now and said, hey, before you leave today, would you just write down what your work is in Christ's church? I don't, I don't really know what to put. It, this may be an incriminating moment, but let me tell you something great. Jesus is great with moments like that. When we're willing to say, God, I've not let this flow through me like I should. I've been a little self-centered about this. He can work with that. Look in Luke 13. It's called repentance and God loves it. Look in Luke 13 and verse 6. Jesus began telling them this parable. He said, a man had a fig tree, which he had planted in the vineyard, his vineyard, his tree. And he came looking for fruit on it and he didn't find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, behold, for three years, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, Fine, but if not, cut it down. Is there anybody in the room here who's right at the end of year three? For three years, dating back from today, the Lord has been investing in you. There's been preaching, there's been teaching, there's been people. The Lord has been fertilizing and working and all he wants you to do is the work that he saved you to do and it's not been real in your life. Great news. You get another year. That's the best, the best news. And it's figurative. Could be a day. Could be a lifetime. And you know what Jesus is willing to do? For the penitent, he said, I'll just keep fertilizing. Now you know why I'm fertilizing your life. Now you know why. And we bear fruit and we are greatly rewarded by the Lord. So what is some of that work? Here's what happened several weeks ago. I introduced the question to our young people. We went through all the same verses you and I just studied. And again, those verses didn't tell you what your work's supposed to be or mine. It just said we're supposed to be at work. It didn't tell you what, if you're an apple tree or, or what you're bearing. It just says every saved person is bearing something. So what are some of those things? We got some great answers here. I want to give you the list of what came about by our young people, and I think it's wonderful. Number one, they said, you know, maybe it's not all at church. They're right about that. It's not all at church. Maybe it's just the way you live in the midst of everybody that you know. It's your example. It's shining, Matthew 5, as a light for Christ in the world. When you go to school on Monday, when you go to work, when you're involved in neighborhood things, on Tuesday when you're in line... Maybe that's it. Maybe it's being a Christ-like spirit, a spiritually focused person, someone who speaks about the greater kingdom. Maybe that's the work. That is a part of the work. And I'm glad that was the first thing that our young people said, and I think that was perfect. If we think that it's all about just coming to church Sunday night, this is not a Sunday night five o'clock sermon. That's just a part of the work. This is a getting out of bed Monday morning going, okay, yesterday was a great day. We sang together, we remembered Jesus together, we studied the word together, we enjoyed one another's company. Now it's Monday morning and I'm headed out in that world. What's the work, God? What do you need me to do? That's the beginning. What a beautiful beginning that is. And that'll show you that the work is every day. We bear fruit all the time. A, a tree that's bearing fruit will have fruit every day of the week. Number two, similar, evangelism. This is a great list inviting people to church, talking to others about Jesus. Sometimes I think Christians think this way. They think, well, you know, the work of a preacher is to preach and the work of the teachers is to teach and the work of the elders is to lead. My work is to just go out and be a pretty good person. That is a part of the work. But there is so much more that you can do for God. How about instead of just being a good person, you actually start talking to people about the church and you hand out things so that they can come and visit. We've had so many people come and visit here because they were invited. And by the way, I mentioned this in the nine o'clock and I wasn't going to mention it to you guys, but here we are. You know, there are some things in the church that I constantly struggle with, like a building. Like this building was not inexpensive. How do we justify building a place like this to worship? I, I wrestle with stuff like that a lot. If you wrestle with stuff like that, let's go wrestle because I do too. But you know what's occurred to me and I've had some elders here help me understand this. What this is, is not just a place to assemble. Our building is one of our number one most powerful evangelism tools. It gives people a place to come. It gives people things to hear on the internet. It gives people an opportunity to see Christians and be with them. But you know what that takes? It takes a whole church inviting people, saying you need to come and be a part of this. Remember, if the grace of God has moved us, we don't just bear fruit. We want other people to come and see that grace as well. Encouragement. I want to talk about your relationship with fellow Christians. 
Building church relationships, older people, younger people, and peers, getting to know your fellow brothers and sisters. I get asked this a lot. Let me get to a couple of practical things here. I get asked a lot, you know, people say, you know, the Lindo Church is a pretty good sized church. I say, yeah, we're, you know, pretty good size. Well, if I became a member there, what would my work be? I, I get asked that great question. I get asked that by people who visit here, by people who are new members here who say, what's my work? I mean, Chris, you, you preach most of the time. You don't really need another preacher. And, and the Lord's Supper talks and the song leading and the Bible class list is always full. Like, like what do I, I want to come here and produce? What do I do? And what I've started telling people is just walk into the church building on a Sunday or a Wednesday and just close your eyes a second and turn around a little bit and just point and open your eyes. It's Shauna Kay. Hi, Shauna Kay. And no matter who you point to, that person has a story to tell. That person is fighting a battle. That person could use some encouragement. That person needs someone to listen. That person likes apple pie. This person likes banana pudding. That person has never seen your house before. They've been a member here five years. They don't even know where you live. You see what I'm saying? Like all you have to do is look around and go, you know what? There's so many people here. People say, I think I'm going to go join a small church so I can do the work. Rethink the work. There are 350 members of this church. There is work for us to do from here until the trumpet sounds. It's all around us. It's relationships. Of course, I'm going to say something to those who are at home. I was at home last week. And I'm going to go ahead and mention that, you know, being at worship is a big part of that, right? Being at worship, being faithful to worship. How are you going to meet people if you're not here? There are people who invite people to church. They invite their neighbor to church. Their neighbor comes on Sunday night and says, hey, where's so-and-so? Well, they don't really come on Sunday night. Don't put me in that position ever again, please. But look, worship is really, really important. But I want to say something to people who are at home. There are people who are unable to be at worship right now. There are people who are in quarantine. There are a few Emersons in quarantine today. There are people at, at exceptional health risk. There are people who are shut in who can't be here and they're watching today. But I want to say something about that. It is impossible to fully worship God from home. Home is a substitute, and you're saying, no, 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 I get to listen to everything and sing along. Listen to me. Worship services is not a place you go to be served. I'm afraid that's a new definition of worship services. I go to a place I get served. Worship service is a place you go to serve, to meet to greet, to interact. We got people who can't be here right now. So all they're able to do is consume. And that's great that you're doing that. You need to consume. But what's the purpose of consumption? What's the whole purpose? To produce. To produce. I, it, it drove me nuts last week. Crazy. Last week. Drove me crazy. I, I'm, I'm listening to three. Jordan was preaching and the thing and he's great. And Jordan's preaching and the Lord's Supper talks were great and everything was great. And I'm sitting at home listening and I'm consuming and I'm loving every moment of it. But I got done and I didn't really feel like I had worshipped. I had worship and so have you if you're at home. But I didn't feel like I'd fully worship because I hadn't done anything for anyone. So I started texting everybody. I was texting everybody. I was like, great Lord's Supper talk. Great. So I even text the AV guy. I was like, tremendous camera angles today, Matt. Well done. Like I couldn't just drink in and go eat lunch. I had to do something. Now, you say, I'm picking on the people at home. I'm not. I'm just saying, you can't ever feel comfortable there. How could you feel comfortable there? Where all you can do is take in and you're unable to give up. Of course, a good argument you could make is Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays. There's lots of ways to serve. So until you can be back here, keep serving every day. But you know, if I want to pick on them, I'll pick on you guys. Sometimes there are people who come to worship. They would never miss worship. Never going to miss worship. Can't go to heaven if you miss worship. If you can be there. They come, they sit down, they get up and they leave. How is that any different? In fact, it is different because they have the opportunity. Some people don't have the opportunity to be here yet. They're actually in the room. And the work is all around us. I like that idea. Of course, I think it should be said that it's not just limited to worship. Those who are unable, shut in, can't be at worship, they can still do great and beautiful work. I still get wonderful cards from some of the ladies here who are unable to be at worship, but they're at work at the post office on Monday. But you know, outside of worship, there's, I didn't make this list. It was beautifully made, though. You have things like studying the word at home so that you can share it. Remember, studying so that you can share. Fertilizing so you can bear fruit. Taking it in is never the end game. It's the beginning of where it's going. But then there's this beautiful thing like contacting people on Tuesday, 
feeding people. One of our elders got up at the end of the nine o'clock hour and said, we have a list of shut-ins who have not been able to be at this building for six months. Have you done what they need you to do? Have they heard from you? Great service we can do. Contacting people, feeding people, helping people. We've got the COVID committee around here. One of the things you get if you get sick is some soup delivered to your door with like peas. You're not going to be able to taste it anyway, but it's really good for you. <laughs> people who do that really important work. You know what I started to notice? Go to Matthew 25. We'll wind this thing down. You know what I started to notice? I was looking at this list, rereading it. Some of you guys helped make that list. And I started noticing that from top to bottom, in services and out of services, look at the top of the screen for a moment, that when you talk about the work of the church, did you, did you notice that the work is the people? You know, God doesn't need our worship. God's going to be perfectly fine. And there's nothing we could do to fill some hole in his life. But there's a lot we can do to fill the hole in the lives of people. And it turns out the work is the people. Look at it from the top. It's shining as a light to people who need Christ. It's inviting people to church who need the peace of Christ. It's getting to know older people, younger people, or people your age. It's at worship, being faithful so that you can encourage and welcome and get to know people. It's contacting people, feeding people, helping people. The work is the people. If you leave here today and you're thinking, oh, I really want to produce. I feel like God's invested a lot in me. What should I be doing? It's people. And I'll show this to you. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says it better than anyone could ever say it. Go to Matthew chapter 25. There are a few stories in Matthew 25 that we know pretty well, but maybe we haven't applied it in the way Jesus wants us to. Let me explain. In the first handful of verses, you have the parable of the 10 virgins. Everybody knows this story. You had five foolish virgins who their lamps ran out of oil. And you had five prudent virgins who were ready when the, the bridegroom, when, the, when he comes out, when the groom comes out, they're ready. And we say, ooh, we need to make sure our lamp is full of oil. If our lamp is full of oil, when Jesus comes back, we're going to heaven. That's true. But what does that mean? I haven't seen a single Christian walking around with a lamp with oil in it. Like, what does it mean? If, you, if your lamp was full of oil... What does that mean? Hold that thought. The next story is about talents. One guy gets five talents, one guy gets two, one guy gets one. And, you know, we sometimes look and say, maybe I don't have that many talents, but everybody here knows they've got something that they can do. That's the beauty of why God saved you. He saved you because he knew you had work that could be done. And it says that whatever you get, just try to, try to double it. Right. Get to work immediately and gain. And so everybody knows that when Jesus comes back, I need to be multiplying my talents. But what does that mean? Is it money? Is that what it means? Is it, is it oil? I mean, even Kidron's like, no, it's not oil, it's not money. He's right. Let me show you guys something. What he means when he says that Christians keep their oil full and their talents multiplying is the people. He means you're serving your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and you're working for them. Let me show you what I mean. Look down in Matthew chapter 25 at the, on the heels of these two stories. He said, let me tell you exactly what I'm talking about. Verse 34, I'll make it very, very clear. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed to my father. I'm in Matthew 25, 34. Inherit the kingdom that is prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now watch this really, really carefully. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? I mean, they go through the whole list here. When did we see you sick? When did we see you in prison and come to you? Now, Jesus has said, Here's what this entire chapter is about, and they don't understand it. My question is, do we understand it? Maybe we read this and say, what do you mean? Like, you're not in front of me. And then he reveals it. The king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. You say, who's the least and who's the most? The point is, there's not a single person around you that God didn't put there for you to serve. There's not a single person. If you're a visitor here today, you're here for us to serve you, and maybe you get to serve us too. Wouldn't that be awesome? If you're a new member of this church, you're here, and God saved you and brought you here because there's some things you can do that people need. I hope you believe in yourself because God believed in you enough to save you. 
And you know what? Maybe we've got a few things we can do for you as well. The work is the people. He goes on to explain in verse 41 that there are people who think they're going to heaven. They're not going to heaven. There are people who think their lamp is full and it's empty. There are people who think their talents are multiplied and it's buried in the backyard. And it's like, I don't ever want to be one of those. And he said, I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was a stranger. I was sick. And you didn't come to me. You didn't produce the food I needed to survive. And then he goes on to say, I'm talking about people. The work is the people. Let me give you one final thought as we conclude. I typed up something a couple of months ago and a friend of mine posted it on his page and that's why he loves coffee. That's why there's a coffee cup in the background there. And I know you probably can't read it here. I printed it in the back larger. When you pick up these notes, you'll be able to read it there. But I just wanted to finish with this. It's, it's something that I think about every day now. It's something that I thought about last week. It's something that I'll need to be thinking about when I get out of bed tomorrow, but I want to read it to you. The work is the people. Please listen carefully and then we'll be done. How can I work in the kingdom? How can I be valuable for Christ? What is is my role in the church? The work is the people. It's getting to know people outside the church. It's praying with them and for them. It's sharing the power of Jesus with them. It's inviting them to come worship with your spiritual family. The work is, is actually at the church building. It's the visitor who just came in. It's the new family who just moved here. It's the conversations. It's the love of strangers. It's the investment you make in other people. The work is the people. It is drawing close to members of the body. It is interaction. It is worship. It is meals. It's time spent with those who need you. The work is the saving and the strengthening of souls. Yours and others. Souls are not nebulous. They're not abstract or theoretical. Souls are in people. Therefore, the work is the people. The work is the people. How awesome is that? It means that everywhere you are every day in every experience, Tuesday in line to vote, tonight when we gather back for worship, You are exactly where God wants you to be to do exactly the work he saved you to do. And if you've ever wondered what it was, just look to your left, look to your right, look around. The future of the Lindell Church, when every part is active to the building up of relationships and the honoring of God, there is no limit to what the body of Christ can do. That's you and that's me. What is the work? What is your work in Christ's church? If you need to be encouraged in that, if you're ready to repent and say, you know what, I'm ready to get back to work. Jesus is great at that. He receives, he fertilizes, and he works with you. If you're not a Christian, all I can say is if you're not a Christian, if you've not joined that body, if you're not filled with God's grace, there'd be no motivation to do the work. It comes straight from the love of God. If you need to experience the love of God, be baptized into Christ, be raised up new and have a story to tell because people need to hear it. If we can help you in that way, come now as we stand and sing.